I will also start my talk from some memories of the time I was in St. Petersburg. I was one of the students of Viktor Havin, did my PhD there, and then left to Trondheim. He was a great teacher, and there are as many stories about Viktor Havin as many students, at least, probably even more. And what I will present from a mathematical point of view, mathematics that are intersected with having on, it has more or less nothing to do with the mathematics you already heard about. It was one of his features. He was very eager to share mathematics, to learn new things, and to grow with his students, or we thought this way, sharing with us lots of ideas, lots of new areas. I think in his mathematical career, there were many points where he could find a good mathematical niche, stay there, and achieve great things. He was forcing himself to go to new areas over and over again, widen his horizon, and sometimes left his students to, to do the things that he was doing previously and so on. He was very nice and generous, and yeah, we will miss his enthusiasm about mathematics, probably try to keep at least some of it, the generosity that is not always comes together with, with great minds and great mathematicians. What I was doing with Haven being his student and PhD student was connected to approximation, very special approximation, I'll go back to it, but I wanted to list three periods where he touched approximation, harmonic and holomorphic approximation. He started very early, right after his thesis, and the uh, roots are in the same duality that Nikolai Kapitonovich was talking about. This duality has implications in approximation theory. Later they did a series of very technical and very deep work with Professor Mazier, I will talk a little bit more about, about this bunch of articles, works, and they are connected to approximation and some initial motivation was in approximation in LP norms. And then when I was a student, Victor Hein was very enthusiastic about harmonic vector fields and differential forms and we were doing some approximation there. Once again, I'll come back to it later. I also met Viktor Petrovich in my first year of university studies. He was our main professor in analysis and doing some extracurriculum work with us. Then I learned potential theory from him in the third year, Durham theory in the fourth year, once again, it was new for him. He was going beyond our end to, to manifolds and studying all, all these things. And then I started to attend the seminar, and I remember this feeling when everyone was talking about harder spaces and K-theta, something that I knew nothing about at this moment. <laughs> it was strange. But once again, he, he was doing many different things, and if you look at the spectrum of interest of his students, it's enormous. One thing that I want to talk a bit more about is his works with Mazia on approximation. And the thing that Viktor Petrovich always repeated, if you want to study approximation, you want to look at the whole triple. Approximation, uniqueness, and normality. You don't do approximation only there, you think always about the dual problem, you think about uniqueness, you think about normal families. There were two sides of this story. One is 
very nice and interesting, and I will not be able to say much about the first one. You have an, a domain omega, a subdomain there. Think about these pictures. Probably a disk touching boundary. And the question is if any function in LP of the difference, analytic one, can be approximated by analytic function in the whole omega, in LP norm. It turns out the question is very delicate, and it was late 60s when Harun and Mazia were spending a lot of energy on this one, and as a result, nonlinear LP capacity appeared first with motivation to, to this approximation problem. Another problem they were doing that I will mention a little bit more is the following uniqueness for the Cauchy problem. I will draw a two-dimensional picture, but you can think about higher-dimensional picture. Think about a domain, part of the boundary is flat, and you have a harmonic function in this domain. We all know that as soon as the, the Cauchy data here is zero, the function is zero. There are many problems how to quantify this. And one problem that was originated from Moscow School and Landis was let us suppose that we have a function that vanishes at this point. You have a harmonic function U. You look at the value of the U on the flat part of the boundary at the value of the normal derivative, what condition on the speed, how fast you go to zero, you should ask for to be sure that the function is, is zero. This happens at one point zero. So you suppose that you have function with very fast decay of function at the first derivative. This is connected to uncertainty principle, and as, as a tool, they use the uncertainty for the usual potential that later was developed by Viktor Petrovich further, and he got some results on nonlinear potentials and risk potentials. But the first was this with this problem of uniqueness in the Cauchy for harmonic functions in Rn. Yeah. Once again, the picture is two-dimensional, rotated in your mind, and think about something higher dimensional. UN is normal derivative. Yes, yes. Un is normal derivative. You assume that your function is good enough, so you can do it in weak sense in L1, at least. There. And there are two answers to, the, to this question. One is given by Harvin and Maziar, they assumed small decay for the function itself and more or less critical decay for the normal derivative. So they assumed that for the function, you know that it goes to zero faster than, I'm, I'm here, yeah, faster than any power of x. So it saying that at this point you have zero in the boundary data of infinite order, but it was not important for them to go to zero along any ray in this boundary part, just along some rays of positive measure. And then for the normal derivative, you assume that you have measurement with 
divergent logarithmic integral. Why this property is necessary, it's easy to, to, to do it, just do the two-dimensional Poisson integral and you will see that the, uh, this integral condition for the log is necessary for uniqueness, but it is sufficient, it was a very hard piece of analysis. And the same series of articles, they did the dual problem in a sense, and the dual problem now is you have this boundary, suppose it is closed boundary, you are given two functions, f1 and f2, and you want to find one harmonic function that will approximate those two. h will approximate the first function and the normal derivative will approximate the second one. You can never do it simultaneously if you assume that your boundary is closed, but you, if you allow yourself one point where this approximation is weakened, you don't do it uniformly, but you have weights that help your approximation just at this one point, then those two problems are dual, and you can show that the weights are the same for those, for those two. And in the same style, they found that this integral condition for the log v is necessary and sufficient for the normality of the family if you formulate the condition in the right way. It's one over small v here, really. <coughs> you look at the functions that are harmonic and with control grows in, in the boundary and the, the corresponding family is normal. Second story that I mentioned, it was about approximation by harmonic vector fields and harmonic differential forms. I will say you later why I take it here. Let us do harmonic vector fields in R3. Field is harmonic if it's divergence free and curl free, and locally it's the gradient of harmonic function, but not globally. And for how it was the right way to think about analytic functions in higher dimensions. Instead of Cauchy-Riemann system, you have this system, and then very strange things happen. We do, we're doing soft approximation <laughs> first with Runge theorem and kind of hartog rosenthal theorem. When you want to approximate function on set of zero measure, and already there you feel that this system is very different from the Cauchy-Riemann system. It's with not subjective symbol, so to say, it's not local. So we have topological difficulties to, to do it in R3. And there was a very beautiful article of Havin Smirnov. Smirnov was master student of Havin who was forced into this field and did very beautiful work there. They separated two problems about approximation by divergence free fields and give, give geometric conditions responsible for this part and also geometric condition responsible for approximation by gradients, coral free functions. The field was tough because there was no tools there. You think like complex analysis and everything you want, try to do like in complex analysis, it doesn't work there. There is no factorization, you can't multiply functions, you can do nothing except for this nice work by, by Stas. When I was a student there, Stas already left. I was in the second, second year student and I switched topic after finishing my PhD quite, quite fast. What I wanted to mention is more recent results with all the ideas of Viktor Petrovich, as soon as it, something was done there, he came back to it many years ago with some of his students. Other his students came back there and I think the story will continue for 
for a long time. As I said, the initial results about the uniqueness, they were needed for this uniqueness in the Cauchy problem and interpolation, oh, sorry, uh, approximation in LP in the work of Maziar, and there is a series of papers from 82 to 2007, one of his master's students, Kostis Yurov, the last two papers are about counterexamples when there is no, no uniqueness for, for his potentials. Havens' last student who defended his PhD thesis this year, this spring, Sasha Lugunov made a nice contribution to normality and higher dimensional potential theory. And when it goes to approximation by differential forms and vector fields, except for this joint work with Harvin, even before that there was a master thesis of Stasmirnov about decomposition of divergence-free vector charges. I was doing this approximation on Riemannian manifolds, one of the former students of Viktor Petrovich took it, and the, the last mentioned paper has something to do with the very first article of having this duality, but now not on the level of analytic functions, but on the level of harmonic fields or forms. And I'm happy to re report that there is another student of Viktor Petrovich, Mikhail Dubashinsky in St. Petersburg, who is trying to develop this field further, and his last preprint appeared this, this month. So it's something that still is alive. I was mentioning this story because, once again, what I was doing was quite soft approximation, but it was on the level of remaining manifolds, approximation, you need uniqueness. Uniqueness you need there is uniqueness that you all believe easily when you work with analytic functions. Everything real analytic, harmonic function is zero at some set, at zero everywhere. As soon as you go from analytic setting to just smooth one, on the Riemann manifolds, it's a very different story. It's a well known, but it's a deep result that you can do uniqueness for elliptic PDs without analyticity. And in having school, it was never take this for granted, you know that this result exists, believe it and use it. You have to understand what you are using. So I spent some time learning, mostly with Viktor Petrovich, this uniqueness theorems, initial ideas due to Kolleman, and then there is a nice development by Orenshine for the setting we needed. But the initial idea of Kordleman is extremely nice. You don't need your function to be harmonic to know that it enjoys unique continuation. What is unique continuation is if your function is zero on some open set or a ball, that it's zero everywhere. No analyticity is needed for that one. What you need is ellipticity and, say, inequality. You don't need an equation that you can work with. You need inequalities to do unique continuation. And the idea of Kurleman was to write such kind of weighted inequalities, L2 norms, you take the right weight, phi, you know that for each t you have this inequality with the same constant that depends on phi, but it never depends on the parameter t. Sometimes it depends, but it's going to be better and better when t is large, so you can assume that one. And you let t go to infinity, do some multiplication by nice function for your solution and you do, you can get the uniqueness as soon as you have this, what is very well known for people who do PDs as Carlemon estimates. 
but they can be used to many different things. You can do in a continuation for elliptic PDs. You can also prove using the Kerlman estimate the uniqueness for the boundary situation for analytic function. And this is one of the two connections to this first part of the talk and the second part that I'm coming to now. Second connection is another question by Landis. Landis conjecture, another one goes also into Schrodinger equation, if you wish, Laplace plus potential, potential is bounded. And now we ask how fast this function can decay at infinity. And the conjecture is that if you decay faster than first power, then you, the function is zero. The conjecture is false if you allow complex potential here. And there is a counterexample with a complex bounded potential that shows that you need at least four thirds for that one. But it's still open for for real ones. What I'm going to talk about is connected to, to this conjecture, but we're not looking at situation like it is here. We are looking at dynamical setting and solve, try to look at the solutions of the Schrodinger equation instead and ask how fast it could go to, to zero at infinity. So let me formulate the problem before that, once again, to remind you the title of my talk. It's about uniqueness for discrete Schrodinger evolutions, and this is joined with Philippe Yamar from Bordeaux, Yuri Lubarsky, and Karl Mikhail, Mikhail Perfect from Trondheim. This is the problem. I do it in dimension one to spare some place. You can do it in high dimensions as well. We we'll look at the discrete Schrodinger evolution, and we suppose that the potential is bounded. Any bounded potential is good. Question is when you have the uncertainty principle. Why does the uncertainty principle? You take a solution of your discrete Schrodinger, you know that at two different times you are well localized and then you say that the, then you are zero. So instead of thinking about localization of function as Fourier transform, we are thinking about localization at two different times and asking how good you can localize your function. The continuous story is solved completely and there is a series of papers by Scoriaza, Kenning, Ponce, Vega. One of these papers is also with calling and the answer is as you would predict. You start with free Schrodinger. If you don't like Schrodinger you probably like heat kernel. You can easily change the time into complex one and write down many solutions to the Schrodinger equation, just heat kernel with complex parameters. The best decay that you can achieve for the free Schrodinger is this one it's Gaussian with the, with the right coefficient in an exponential, and it's achieved by the Gaussian-like function. You can easily write down what is the evolution of this function once again, convolved with a heat kernel, you get the exponential function once again. And they showed that the same is true for perturbed Equation. You can add any 
bounded potential and you will still have the same uniqueness result. Why you want to do bounded potentials? Bounded potentials, bounded real potentials even, will cover the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. So this is, this looks like a linear equation, but since our potential is just any bounded, we can cover many, many interesting equations with that one. It is continuous case, and for the free equation, it's a very simple exercise that the result is equivalent to the famous Hartz's uncertainty principle. So to say that in this free Schrodinger evolution you can control function at two times, it's equivalent to the fact that function at Fourier transform can lie below the Gaussian <laughs> function. Heisenberg uncertainty principle can be also reformulated in terms of this dynamical evolution. I will not spend time on, on that. What is the main ingredients? It's logarithmic convexity. What is logarithmic convexity? It's a Dermar three cycle theorem. We know how the maximum or L2 norm of an analytic function depends on the radius. And once again, it's not about the harmonicity of the logarithm, as you would say, think. It's a very general fact about elliptic equations. You have traces of this Adamar three cycle theorem as soon as you have elliptic operators. And it was developed by Agmon's idea of logarithmic convexity. Well, well, there were also results by Landis and his students. There are papers of Harp Har and Brumelius on these types of three circle theorems. So the idea of Scorazza, Kenning, Ponce and Weger was to look at the weighted norm. At each time t you have your solution, you apply a weight that will help you with your decay. The, the, the weight is big. But if your function decays fast, you can still multiply by this growing weight and compute the norm. And prove formally that this norm is convex, logarithmically convex. It means that second derivative is, of the logarithm is positive. You can't be so lucky when you go from free and perturb situation to some weight and add potential, but still you can control the second derivative. This will give you the following inequality. It, first year calculus, if you know how to control the second derivative of the logarithm, multiply by exponential function, you get, get something that is truly convex, and you write this convexity estimated 0.1 half through estimates at the zero and one. And we were well, they were tricky with their weight, so you see that the weight at points one and zero disappears. So when I wrote my last line here, this part depends on R, but that one doesn't. And we use this powerful Kurlemann's idea, we take R to go to zero, and we get uniqueness as soon as our parameters are chosen in the right way. This is not the whole truth. It will give the result only for A large enough, not, sorry, not one fourth. You will get this only for one half, say you need other tools to pull yourself out of, of there and, and do the results. But the first idea is, is like that. So now we want to go to the discrete setting, and instead of the Laplacian in Rn, look at the Laplacian on the lattice. You still have lots of old results there that were done for the discrete potential theory when it was 
approximation to the continuous one, but there is also a new approach to, to the discrete things, not as an approximation to continuous one, but some, something that probably describes our world better than the continuous one. And it, from the result that we need, we need computation of the heat kernel for the discrete lattices. It's not a very difficult one, but it is written very clearly in papers of Chang and Yarrow. And we need some ideas of the convexity that can, can be done in discrete case as well. As soon as you think about the convexity in discrete case, you understand that it's not the same as in continuous case. You don't have circles anymore. You don't have this symmetry that you have that you had in Rn, your Laplacian is not rotationally symmetric. You don't have the right basis. But still it's possible to do some logarithmic convexity for harmonic functions, solutions of the heat equation, and so on. So what we want to do, we want to find the right weight for which the norm will be logarithmically convex, up to some constants. Never mind. But first question is, write what is the Gaussian for the discrete case? And the answer is in the first line, the Gaussian is a heat kernel. If you want to understand the right decay in the Hardy uncertainty principle, you want to know what is the heat kernel for your equation. I don't know why. I would be happy to, to see approach that gives you both discrete continuous case and probably something in between in one step. That the heat kernel for free Laplacian or for free operator is really the right condition to be under. But to, to find out that this, so we look at the free case when we have no potential first, then everything is more or less simple, you can write down the solutions explicitly and you find that the best decay will be that of the Bessel function. To prove it carefully, look at the following Fourier series, take your data, it's one dimensional now, but as I said, it's not very important, look at the series, then you can solve the equation on the Fourier side, you have the the following dynamics. And we assume that we know the estimates for the coefficients of function at moment one and zero. It's almost an entire function. It's an analytic function with two singularities, infinity and zero. You know that it's not allowed to grow too fast because of the estimates on the coefficients. Then you have fragment Lindelof theorem that will show you that it, it's not allowed to go to zero too fast along phrase. And if you want to satisfy this condition, you're not allowed to grow too fast and not allowed to decay too fast, you will not be able to get the exponential function at the ratio of those two. A little bit more careful analysis shows you that if you decay or grow with the least possible, in the least possible way, you have a unique solution that is given here. So what we need is only fragment Lindelof. But this was a toy model, no potential. In, in the level of classical analysis, not discrete one, it's the hard uncertainty principle. And we want more. First, what we can do is to add potential that is just bounded real valued and doesn't depend on time. This can be done more or less in the same spirit. You need a little bit more, but there is a uniqueness there. You do the same for your side. You don't know what your E and lambda are now, some say orthogonal polynomials in one dimensional case. You use fragment Lindelof theorem and you use spectral theorem to show that if this function is zero, then your sequence is zero as well. There, there are two 
Disadvantages of this method, once we, we fixed V, we fixed our operator and we think about the right hand side as a fixed operator in time, it will definitely not, not allow you to go here. And another, we don't know what to do if the potential is complex valued. We believe that this result should be still valid with complex valued potential. But we don't know for the moment why, why this is true. Second, yeah. And from all that, I, I know what my weight is, what kind of weight I want to, to use to prove the logarithmic convexity. The problem is how to, to prove it. And the result is weaker than we wish for the moment. It's recent. As I said, a joint work with Philippe, Yuri, and Kali. And it also was done independently by Angera Fernandez, Bertolin, and Luis Weger. The result is the following. If you have Schrodinger, discrete Schrodinger evolution, with bounded potential, depends on time, and you know that the decay at two moments is fast, then the solution is zero. This fast, unfortunately, for the moment, had this parameter gamma. We believe that this gamma should be one, or we believe that the whole play should be on the other level. The right weight would be And this is constant where you should do the, the right asymptotics. That should be the 2 plus epsilon if we are lucky. For the moment, we have a, an extra constant here. In our case, it's some, some ugly one, but yeah. Bigger than 1, but it's less than 3, I guess. What are the, the tools? The tools are more or the same as in the continuous case. I will skip this technical part. I will just show you the computation here. It's the computation that everyone who were doing Kerlman estimates were doing at least once in his life. You, if you want to do Kerlman estimates, you do commutator of your, you do your operator, divide it into symmetric and anti-symmetric part, and you want to estimate the commutator of those two. The, these estimates are, are the soul of the Kordleman estimates and the right choice of the, of the operator there, the weight function. So what we need to estimate our second derivative is to estimate the commutator of two operators and show formally that our function is logarithmically convex. When we do that, we also need some justification of our computation because in the initial situation you have decay at two moments, zero and one. You need to know that you have some control in between to be able to form this weighted norm. And it turns out that this is technical and true. If you control your function at zero and one, you have some control in between. If it, it decays fast at moment zero and one, it decays probably a little bit slower, but it decays between those two times. So it's not a, a, big, a big problem. But we need some technical details to, to achieve that. And finally, with, with this weight, we were able to show that the second derivative can be Bound it, it's not a constant that you bound it, but you try to bound it by something that grows not as fast as your initial weight. Our weight grows as gamma r log r. We bound the second logarithmic derivative by something with another constant, and then we play with the constants. If one constant is bigger than another, we are done but for the moment we can do it only under this, this condition that gamma is bigger than three plus square root of three over two. There is another approach taken by 
Fernandez, Bertolin and Weger, they did the uniqueness in a different way and still they have the same problem for the moment that the extra constant appears in the, in the condition here. I have some minutes, I guess, yeah. I will do one thing, I will give you a simple proof of the Hardy uncertainty principle. There are lots of proofs, I don't know about sevens, probably not, but the one that I like and I hope that I can repeat it for the discrete case, but unfortunately not. And the trick is, think about this equation, yeah. I will, I will do it in dynamical terms. So I have a solution to the free Schrodinger. I start with some initial data that decays very fast. I know that at point, point one I will also decay fast and I want to say that the, the solution is zero. Think about Schrodinger equation and let time be complex. So I can write down what is the solution of the equation. You have to convolve with a heat kernel and you can write heat kernel for a complex parameter there. For Schrodinger, you should write IT here for heat kernel, you write T, do it in a complex way. Where can you do it? If you think about your equation, you start with L2 solution. You can do it if the function decays fast everywhere except for this circle. <coughs> The convolution makes sense as soon as z is in the complex plane minus this circle, because I have conditions on the decay of the initial value. Yeah, you know that you can always solve heat equation in the right way. You can always solve Schrodinger here, starting with L2 data backwards heat is a problem. So you have some domain here that is not a lot. And now suppose that you have also your solution at point one in this point, point I, I should write, right? It's exactly my Schrodinger at point one. If this one is small, I can extend my solution, well, it should be tangent, to any point of the complex plane except this disk. If your parameter is less than one half, so if u of zero x, yeah, now I have to, to think hard. Yeah, my, my constant is probably wrong. But if you have one plus epsilon, the constant, those two circles, they don't touch. So you get a solution everywhere, but you can also easily check that if you fix x, this function is a bounded. So you get a bounded analytic function. If your parameter is the, on the boundary, what you get is solution everywhere except to one point. You have an analytic function except for one point, you can easily write down what this function is. And it somehow explains you why the heat kernel is responsible for the growth. Or you would wish to think so. As soon as we go from continuous case to the discrete one, the situation is completely different. If you do discrete case, you can convolve with anything. You can always solve heat equation backwards and forwards. You get another conditions of your entire functions. And we would love to have an approach that gives you feeling of both situations at the same time and explain why in the heart and certainly the principle you have the heat kernel in some heuristic way at least. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll stop here. <laughs>